Thank you. Um, I also thank um, the GCI as well as the Clifford Still Museum for inviting me to participate in this conf conference. Without Carol's courage, um, I have chosen to stick with my discussion of de, Kooz de Kooning's materials and techniques, but this conviction um, does reflect my firm belief, which we can discuss later, that technical analysis is a very important first step um, in any conservation or preservation discussion. And um, as this says, yes, I am retired, but I'm still doing research at the Hirshhorn. Tom? Oh, sorry. Um, the Kooning's materials have long caused speculation, rumor, and even debate about, among both conservators as well as art historians, primarily on the basis of visual examination and anecdotes. Did he um, restrict himself largely to artist two paints, as was reported at the time? Did he eventually, um, and at times, have forays in um, using um, house paints? And if so, how extensively? There's a memo in the Metropolitan Museum um, curatorial files that says he talked with John Brealey about um, getting a good recipe for egg tempera. Did he at some point add egg to his paints? Or did he, as was once widely reported, um, include mayonnaise in his works of the 60s and 70s to get the frothy, smooth consistency to his paints? My research began with the attempt to answer some of these questions. And of course that resulted in, um, as Tim mentioned, the first volume of the Getty's uh, GCI's Art, Artist Materials series that was published along with others with the aim of making available in-depth studies of the materials and techniques adopted by modern artists and exploring the implication that these materials may have on the long-term care and preservation of the works created using them. So <laughs> I wonder how many of us, how many of the speakers are going to show this. <laughs> Unlike many of the painters of the abstract expressionist movement, de Kooning developed several signature styles. No signature, uh, no single image characterizes his career, as for example the board paintings of Pollock or the abstract typographies of Clifford Still. Throughout his career, um, de Kooning, in fact move back and forth between abstract and figurative modes and with scholarship, both um, curatorial uh, as well as conservation uh, or conservation research, we're recognizing that these modes um, mingle and intermix more than um, previously thought. In a broader sense, my research on de Kooning attempted to de determine the degree to which de Kooning's significant shifts in styles correspond to changes in technical procedures. When a painting from one period, such as what you, the 1950 work that you see on the left, significantly differed from works from the 1960s and 70s, is this evidence that he varied his practice? Or is it, as Hess reported, that ex except with rare occasion, he restricted himself to artist two paints, but just used them and um, applied them in a different and unconventional ways. While studying de Kooning, it's important to keep in mind that he brought to his craft a rigorous um, training, a European training. He um, studied at the um, Rotterdam uh, Academy of Art. After that, he apprenticed in Rotterdam at a commercial design and decorating firm. Once he emigrated to the United States, he um, not only worked as a uh, fine art painter, but um, worked as a house painter, a sign painter, and did, did a variety of other commercial um, art jobs when times were lean. Both his training and his work experience gave him a profound respect for materials and skilled craftsmanship that was fundamental throughout his career. In the interest of time, I'm going to focus on just two paintings. One, the female figure, um, woman 1948, 
which uh, he did relatively early in his career, and the second is Woman Sag Harbor from 64, which he uh, executed shortly after he moved to Long Island. This is Woman 48 and Woman Sag Harbor. Woman 1948 is the first major surviving painting from de Kooning's second women series. Technical examination reveals that this work and contemporary abstractions of the period were selected and he used a, um, a variety of, of traditional art supplies as well as non-art products who he which he deliberately enhanced and uh, manipulated. At first glance, woman seems to have been done when, in one sitting with colors blended on the surface. And indeed, what we see here was done at great speed. An x-ray of this painting, which unfortunately has not been yet digitized, but also a number of cross sections, reveal that de Kooning was working in a well-established pattern of applying his paints, partially scraping them down, and then applying additional paints. But as a result, all the works of these pairs that I've um, examined have significant builds up of paint, of paint layers. In fact, Woman 48 was painted over an initial black and white abstraction. The figure's anatomical elements, her skirt, which you see in this cross section, and the raised area of the star at the top right corner were added only in the final stages of the painting's composition. As you, sorry. Identification of the paints of woman and comparison of the, uh, those analytical results with um, contemporary uh, black and white abstractions as well as the colored abstraction shows that there is less of a dichotomy between these two bodies of work than was previously thought. The binding, excuse me, the binding meaning of the yellow um, woman's hair was, uh, is an artist's two paint. The um, white and off-white as well as the pink paints, the off-white and white and black paints of Zurich, as well as two other black and white um, compositions that I analyze. The yellow and the whites of um, special delivery. And the black paints of secretary were all um, identified as um, mixtures of drying oil and pine resin or colophony. Such a mixture, drying oil and pine resin from a conifer, is an oleoresinous paint sold by the retail trade paint industry as house paint or an inexpensive enamel, depending on the percentage of resin in that mixture. The black paint of woman and the gray of secretary are also retail trade paints, but in this case, they're oil-modified alkyds. And these are the, this is the earliest example in de Kooning's work in which I identified alkyd paints. Identification of these paints contradicts reports of the time that de Kooning before 1960 was with few exceptions using conventional artist paints. Rather, he was taking advantage of the expanding range of commercial paints available in the 1940s and the post-war years. That, but in de Kooning's case, it's important to remember that he restricted himself to um, what he was marketed as oil paint. He never used any of the acrylics. Of course, de Kooning was not alone among his colleagues, and we're already hearing, and you'll hear a lot more about this, in taking advantage of, the new, uh, of retail trade paints on the market. To cite a few examples, composition with pouring two. The um, lower layers are all artist two paints, but the upper drip layer is an oleoresinous. All the upper paint layers of um, tiger, also by Pollock, are um, alkyds. Um, with the exception of the high impostoed white, which you see here, which is an artist tube paint. The black of um, Delaware Gap by Franz Klein was identified as um, an alkyd, as was the matte black on Hans Hoffmann's to JFK. Back to de Kooning. A significant number of de Kooning's paintings from the 40s and well into the 1950s 
show unusual textural contrast that Hess described as smoothly fluid in some places and scarred and clotted in others. Again, techn uh, technical analysis reveals that this is not solely due to the paints that he chose, nor even to his techniques of applying them. Woman is painted on masonite, and in this case he's chosen the rough side of the fiberboard panel and has not applied a ground layer to diminish the prominent screen texture. This is significant because in a lot of de Kooning's works of this period are executed on masonite, but in all previous works that I examined, he used the smooth side of masonite and applied a very smooth ground. As he had done in earlier works, de Kooning um, uh, mer began to merge painting and drawing, but now takes it to a greater extreme. In secretary, he bore down heavily on sharp sticks of charcoal scoring the paint. In special delivery, he pulled brushes and probably scrapers through the paint when it was still soft, and the solvents in that paint and the mechanical action of the tools made the charcoal in different colors ble uh, bleed one into the other. In woman, he smeared charcoal into the surfaces of the still soft paints, smudging the brighter colors. I just show you a detail of the yellow, but that's true of the whites as well as the pinks, and you can see the charcoal in these two different magnified views. Um, he diluted the black alkyd to the consistency of a watercolor. And as it ran down the picture surface in runnels, it soaked into the lower paint, staining them a grimy black. Paint cross-sections, dispersed samples, and microscopic examination of the surfaces of women and additional works of the, um, from the 19, both 1940s and 50s also show that at this point, de Kooning was beginning to doctor his paints by adding extraneous gritty materials to them. He blended quartz, probably sand or pebbles, into the gray paints of woman. He also added um, shards of brown and clear glass to the white and pink paints around the seated figure. And he mixed significant amounts of plaster of Paris into the off-white paints to render the figure's torso and the perimeter of, star of that star that I showed you earlier. And the addition of huge amounts of plaster of Paris into these paints gives this work its almost sculptural um, quality, which was discussed in the in the, in the, at the time. The coarsely textured gray paint of Secretary is also the result of the addition of quartz, but also glass particles into the Alcott House paint. By contrast, the smooth, glossy yellow of Secretary is an artist tube paint to which de Kooning added significant amounts of wax. In special delivery, he mixed irregular pieces of quartz, but also clumps of plaster of Paris, making no effort to, to um, grind or blend the plaster into the paint. The white paint of special delivery is surely a paint that de, uh, de Kooning made himself, as you can see in this detail in photomicrograph. It's plaster of Paris powder mixed with an oil resin varnish. Analytical evidence that de Kooning mixed extraneous materials into his paints and that he, used, he did in fact use retail trade paints is supported by archival and testimonial evidence. This 1950 photograph of de Kooning's studio shows a box of rainbow plaster of Paris on the windowsill, as well as tubes of artist paint and several cans with a sapelin label on the work table. According to Patricia Pasloff, I'll go back to this, um, who studied with de Kooning for several years uh, beginning in 1948, the artist regularly mixed solid materials such as plaster of Paris into his paints to bulk them up and extend his medium. She also confirmed that he used um, quartz. Um, Passoff also um, said that de Kooning used retail trade paints, some of them oil-based enamels that he bought from a nearby so store that sold sign painting supplies. He purchased house paints from a paint store that sold both Ripplin and Sapolin brands, though I've never found any uh, images that show anything but the uh, cans with a sapolin label. 
She said he chose his paints because he was familiar with their properties from his days when he painted houses and worked as a sign painter. Not only were they less expensive than artist tube paint, but he reasoned that because they were designed for outdoor use, they should be very durable. So in sum, um, the paints of uh, de Kooning's works of the 40s and 50s leave little doubt that he was creating these exaggerated textures um, deliberately. The novelty of these paintings lies not only in their imagery, but in their morphology. John McMahon, um, de Kooning's um, studio assistant from about 1948 into the, in the 1940s and into the 60s told me that when he and de Kooning attended an exhibition that included works from the 1940s as well as the 1950s, McMahon commented on the dingy surfaces of these paintings and de Kooning, he said very emphatically, told him that they didn't need to be sent to a conservator, that they were um, intended to, to, they were painted intended to look that way. The art that de Kooning produced after about 1960, when he was spending increasing amounts of time on Long Island, is sometimes discussed as a distinct and different body of work. Between 1964 and 66, he painted a series of larger-than-life female, uh, female images on hollow cord doors. The doors were available because they had been discarded during construction of his studio that he was building for, him, build, building for himself. Analysis of this work confirms a shift in de Kooning's technical procedures that began around 1960. He continued many of the practices he was using in the, pa in the paintings of the 40s as he simultaneously adopted new materials and developed new methods um, of using them. Woman Sag Harbor was painted, was the first of the door paintings when painted in 64. Woman 65 painted a year later and um, was probably the second. John McMahon recalls um, that de Kooning's, recalls receiving from de Kooning very elaborate specifications in preparation of grounds for these works. So these works all have, have um, white grounds. And this um, preparation involved up to six, sometimes eight layers of white oil paint with each application sanded to a smooth finish with the finest grit sandpaper. Photographs and anecdotal references suggest that by the time de Kooning was painting these pictures, he had discontinued his use of house paints. Instead, he was using artist tube paints to which he was adding safflower cooking oil. And you can see the bottle of cooking oil on his work table. De Kooning told an interviewer uh, in an obscure um, Long Island paper that he used safflower oil because it stays wet a long time. I didn't, it, it didn't dry like linseed oil. I could work it longer. According to McMahon, de Kooney began preparing very specific paint mixtures around 1962. He was using Bellini artist tube paints and he was combining them according to certain recipes. Once he had combined a certain set number of artist tubes to get the color he wanted, he would then scoop the mixture, he would mix it on a glass pot palette, but then he would scoop the mixture into a bowl and then added safflower oil, water, and um, kerosene or some other solvent, whipping the ingredients with a brush 